Hi, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You're listening to Living the Wildlife, discussing all things related to vertebrate pest control as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, wildlife control consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you on board. I hope your week went well. Uh, My time is uh, looking to be gearing up pretty quick. We're getting into training season where I have a lot of, I'll have, excuse me, obligations to get out there in the field and do some training for some people. And so it's going to be tiresome, but the, the commute is beautiful here in the great state of Montana. Do take a few moments, if you would, to subscribe to the channel. Be like, subscribe to what? Well, uh, for this particular podcast is about all things related to vertebrate pest control. So we get a little geeky here as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. So everything involving animals with a spine and related to their control and management, that's what this podcast is all about. So we get kind of technical here. We talk about subjects that aren't addressed by other podcasts related to vertebrate pest control. So those of you who've been following uh, along with my podcast know that I've had a kind of a series of bear videos uh, in terms of bear management videos and things related to grizzly bear attacks, black bear attacks, both lethal and non-lethal. And so we've been kind of covering through those. Well, we're kind of getting to the end of this. I have two more podcasts to go and we're going to be covering bear spray. So if you would, if you're interested in this sort of work, we do hope that you would subscribe to the channel and you can definitely uh, also reach out to me at Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com would love to hear from you and let me know about your thoughts about the show things that you like things you don't like perhaps suggesting topics that you would like to have covered maybe you would even want to be on the show we're always looking for guests to give our uh, audience new things that they wouldn't necessarily know about otherwise. And so again, that's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com. All right, well, let's get right to it. Let me pull up my PowerPoint. You're like, Stephen, why are you getting involved in all this? Well, it's because uh, I have to do a training uh, in January on, on bears and bear attacks for uh, the search and rescue team that I'm a part of. We do have bears in Montana, as you have bears in a lot of other states as well. It's not just a Montana thing. But in Montana, the bear range has certainly been expanding, particularly in the area of grizzly bears. And of course, any of you know anything about grizzly bears, grizzly bears are uh, a top carnivore, and they are not to be fooled with. And so... Uh, They are a serious beast, and so certainly with us going out into the field and rescuing and searching and rescuing for people, well, we need to be thinking about injuries that can occur to our team and also to uh, the people that get lost or injured out in the field. So uh, this is a training as I did research on this this material and put it all together and going to be giving a training to our search and rescue team out in January. So you're able to get kind of a preview of some of this. And of course, I tweak things later on. I'm always in terms of making it better in terms of the view. So you're kind of getting that that rougher draft that before I go out live and do it in other places. So nevertheless, content is content. So why don't we get to it? So this is going to be bear spray part one. And so the article that I get a lot of this information from is by Tom S. Smith, and you're going to hear that name again in part two, so pay attention to him. Tom S. Smith, Stephen Herrero, Terry D. DeBrian, James M. Wilder, and these four individuals wrote an article called Efficacy of Bear Deterrent Spray in Alaska, and that was published in 2008. So not recent to be sure. I mean, a lot of the scientists, scientific community always like to have articles like within the last five years or something magical about that. Uh, I think a lot of that is somewhat silly. Uh, certainly in some pla- some ways, later information is going to be better, but not always. And sometimes they just have this sort of uh, antique bias that really kind of... Uh, 
hinders, I think, scientific progress, but uh, that's a topic for another uh, presentation. Nevertheless, this was published in the Journal of Wildlife Management, a premier journal on all things related to wildlife, and the, uh, the volume number was 72, ed edition, uh, issue 3, I should say, pages 640 to 645. So let me read that title for you again. Tom S. Smith et al. There's other authors there, but he's the first author. Efficacy of Bear Deterrent Spray in Alaska, 2008, in the Journal of Wildlife Management, volume 72, issue 3, pages 640 to 645. So... Let's get on with it. So as the title of the article suggests, this was information collated from activities in Alaska. And so as you can tell, Alaska has had a lot of bears, both black bears and grizzly bears. And of course, that is a great location when it comes to having encounters because you have to have enough animals in people interaction to have those encounters to get data on how well bear spray works, right? So there's nothing special about bear spray in Alaska. Uh, other than, in other words, it's not a different bear spray than what we would have here in the lower 48, right? So that's the point. What they're pointing out is that this is where they're getting their data from, okay? So this is for human bear interactions with bear spray that occurred in the state of Alaska. So their collation of information, they got data from 1985 to 2006, so a pretty pretty good range there. And so what their research developed was they found 83 spraying incidents. Interestingly, 61 of those, that's 61 out of 83 incidents, occurred with grizzly bears. 20 of those incidents occurred with black bear, and then the last two incidents were with polar bear. Now, those of us in the lower 48, we're not going to be dealing with polar bear, obviously, unless you have some sort of an escape from a, from a zoo, perish the thought. But anyways, that's the situation, that that's the data set that they're working with, talking about the efficacy of these bear sprays. So 72 of those 83 spraying incidents involved aggressive bears. 11 of the spray incidents involved the misuse or bear attraction to the residues. So interestingly, 11 times bear spray was used, it was not used in an appropriate manner, or the bear spray act, actually acted as an attractant to bear spray. Now you may have heard the joke if you've been out in the, in the field at all with, with bear spray, they say, how do you know uh, how do you know that the you're dealing with bear, uh, bear scat? Well, if you sniff it, it should smell of pepper spray, right? So you, the idea being is that the person who sprayed the bear ultimately got eaten by, by, the, by the bear, and so they crap out scat that has bear spray in it, right? So that's kind of the joke, ha, ha, ha. But nevertheless, you're going to find that bear spray actually is rather effective, but they're going to talk about some of those limitations in how it was actually used in real situations, which can certainly be instructive so that, A, we learn from the, the benefits of what other people did correctly, as well as we can learn of what not to do when things kind of went wrong and how to avoid misuse of the spray. So the first part is they're going to evaluate those elements that dealt with grizzly bears. And so in the 50 encounters with grizzly bears, bear spray stopped 46 of those undesirable behaviors. Now, you say, well, I thought you said there were more than that earlier. Yes, but they what they were talking about, not all of the encounters with grizzly bears were, were negative or involved a person, right? So all the bear-inflicted injuries, in other words, every time a person was injured by a bear, it was a grizzly bear. So this is what makes grizzlies sort of an upper-level animal because people can have encounters with black bears and they they could be violent don't get me wrong but grizzlies sort of take it up a notch right sort of like be, be fighting someone in the street who may have just street smarts versus someone who is a trained mma fighter right so different level so the grizzly is like a trained mma fighter and 
all of these injuries with grizzly bears fortunately didn't involve uh, hospitalization so it doesn't mean so they were relatively minor in that sense that people didn't have to be hospitalized so what were those grizzly bears doing what was the characteristic of what those grizzly bears were doing well 62 percent of those grizzly bears at 62 percent of the 50 encounters they were searching for food which shouldn't surprise anyone who's been following the podcast 13% were acting aggressively for food, right? So it wasn't just simply looking for food. They were wanting, they were being aggressive about it. In 77% of those encounters, the bear was acting alone. So sometimes you're actually encountering bears with more than one type of encounter. And then interestingly, sometimes bears returned to the, the site of the incident after being sprayed which is kind of interesting about why that occurred so don't linger around the location where you've had a bear encounter now with black bear they found that 85 percent of the time the spray was effective but like the grizzly bear sometimes those black bears returned to the site where the spray event occurred 68 percent of the time the black bears were looking for food makes perfect sense 35% they were acting in an aggressive manner toward people. None of the bears were aggressive toward people in search of food. And in one situation, three bears were together. So that can certainly raise the risk factor up substantially. Now, what were the people doing? Well, this is here you have sort of a histogram here uh, or a bar chart. And so people were doing a variety of different activities. In other words, sometimes you may say, well, maybe they were hunting for bear. Well, sometimes they were hunting for bear. Bear management might be part of that in terms of hunting or stalking bears as in terms of one incident. But sometimes people were just simply hiking in the woods as you see 24 different incidents. People were just simply enjoying, enjoying nature and had uh, an encounter with a bear. So it kind of, kind of cuts the gamut. Notice that one of these, there were 10 encounters that involved people at their own home or in the cabin. I think if memory serves, some of those events occurred, people were even inside their cabin and the bear attacked the cabin with them in it, right? So that can be quite a scary event. Now, what time of day did these incidents occur? And you can see this sort of, uh, I'm going to call it a spider web chart, but it's really kind of giving you an idea of when these incidents occurred so if you're looking at this if you're not if you're well, driving don't look at your phone okay but what you're looking at is in terms of the outer ring tells you the hour of the day using military time and the farther out you get toward the edge of the spider web the more encounters there were so it goes from zero at the innermost ring all the way out to six encounters at the outer ring and then you have uh, the times that it would go with. So five particular events occurred at 2100 hours, which would be, uh, what is that? Uh, 9 p.m. in the evening. Six events occurred at 12 p.m. noon. And then you have sort of a smattering of other situations where people at between 9 and 10 o'clock, you had basically two incidents. You had three incidents, or actually I think four incidents at between 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock in the evening. So you can see kind of a little bit of a spray there in terms of times, but generally speaking, something in the morning and then later afternoon into the early into the early evening now when people used spray how how did those spray events take place how did how well did they work we've already talked about some of the efficacy information but now we're looking at some of the mechanics how well did the spray actually work mechanically right so seven percent of the time the spray use wind was reported as a problem so out of let's say uh, if, if there were a hundred incidents seven times out of a hundred a person had trouble with the wind situation interestingly even with the spray all the all the people had a problem with bears 
uh, excuse me, the spray reached the bear in every single circumstance. And users had negative to side effects from irritation to incapacitation when there was uh, when they got sprayed by the spray. In other words, this, uh, I've gotten a little bit of a whiff of it. I can assure you it is serious. Uh, th this, this capsaicin spray that they're using is pretty strong. You don't want to be playing around with it to be sure. The mean distance of when people were shooting it was four meters. So you're looking at somewhere around 12, 13 feet. And then the distances of variable on hitting the bear were greater than 10 meters, which is over about 33, about 33 feet. Uh, sprays, the mechanical problems didn't occur for 71 of the reporter, reported cases. So people didn't have problems with the device itself. And the wind wasn't a big issue. And the reason is, is because forests typically reduce the effect of wind. But if you're out in an area where you're maybe near a river or something and there's wide open spaces like they have up in up in Alaska, you could have in issues with wind in that situation. But wind did reduce the efficacy of it. And this efficacy meaning how far the spray could travel. And that certainly you want distance between you and the bear. Now, there were some instances of spray misuse. All of them involved grizzly bears where people would spray objects trying to keep a bear away from it. In fact, it didn't work the bears would be attracted to the spray, which is rather interesting. And 18% of the time, they were used as zonal repellents. In other words, they were trying to keep the bear away from an area rather than a particular object. But again, that didn't work. It actually attracted bears to the area. So bottom line, don't do that, right? So don't spray objects with your bear spray thinking that it's going to be repellent to the bear. So we're, there were reasons for people actually not using the spray. One of them they some one of them was that people thought the spray was too weak to actually work. That is not true. And then other people thought that the wind made it ineffective at best. That is also not true. And in worst case scenarios, however, uh, the, the spray could turn it to against you that certainly can happen but remember that's coming out with enough force and this is where part two will come in there's enough force coming out of that spray that it will work even when even opposing wind but you're going to pay a price for it when when it's getting back when it's getting blown into your face uh so you will be uh, uh so you need to be mindful of the wind so that's basically it for part one on our base bear spray we'll have more information on part two Hope you've uh, found this at least fascinating and definitely I hope you're encouraged by the fact that bear spray does work. You have to have it handy enough to use effectively and we'll talk about better procedures on the use of the product uh, in our next uh, podcast. But nevertheless, I hope you understand bear spray does work. You need to keep it handy, keep it fresh, and don't be afraid to use it and keep monitoring your situation. So I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Do take a few moments, if you would, to subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, and also send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you. Interested in being on the show? Definitely say so. And we would be able to talk more I think there's a lot of information out there that should be getting out to the public. Happy to help facilitate that. So this is Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Well, because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everyone. This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast for Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here.